St. Thomas Aquinas, the existence of God can be provided in five ways. Thomas Aquinas is considered one of the doctors of the Church by the Roman Catholic Church and his arguments are heavily valued by other denominations. In his work Summa Theologica, he exposes five ways in which we can supposedly prove the existence of God. The first three of these ways have some common attributes with similar arguments, such as the Callum's cosmological argument and the Leibniz principle of sufficient reason, and they can be grouped together as cosmological or first cause arguments. Some of my analysis of Aquinas' first way will apply to all cosmological or first cause arguments. The fourth way by Aquinas, the argument from gradation of being, is an argument that I have not seen much everywhere, while the fifth way, the argument from design, is also a common argument, but I will focus today on the first way. The first way, argument from motion. Let's see this argument. The wording is taken from this page, which I understand is a translation from Latin by the files of the English Dominican province in 1920. This translation is not in public domain, as I have not searched it, so I take the word from the web page. 1. Our senses prove that some things are in motion. 2. Things move when potential motion becomes actual motion. 3. Only an actual motion can convert a potential motion into an actual motion. 4. Nothing can be at once in both actually and potentially in the same respect. For example, if both actual and potential, it is actual in one respect and potential in another. 5. Therefore nothing can move itself. 6. Therefore each thing in motion is moved by something else. 7. The second of motion cannot extend ad infinitum. 8. Therefore it is necessary to arrive at a first mover put in motion by no other, and this everyone understands to be God. I will move right into the conclusion, which is what I find common in all cosmological or first cause arguments. A. Everything must be caused by something else. B. The causation of chains cannot be infinite. C. Therefore there must be an uncaused cause. D. That happens to be my predefined God. The impossibility of infinite causation or in this specific argument, the infinite sequence of motion is just waved. And I wonder if the philosophers, since the time of Zeno of Elia, just have an impossibility to describe infinites. In my formation in mathematics, and as an engineer who have need to work with Laplace transformations, infinites in the past are workable variables. Infinite causation is a non-issue. All arguments I have heard against infinite regression assume that the infinite count began at some point and therefore has not yet reached the present, the actuality but that's the wrong way to see the problem, wherein the actual moments, just that for each moment there always was a previous moment. So you claim everything to be caused, and then you negate infinite regression of causation, that requires an exception to the first premise by necessity of the second premise. If you have already decided that the exception is God, that is a special pleading. The first premise should read, everything but a necessary exception. But then, why only one exception? Why not two exceptions, or three, or one hundred? or infinite exceptions. The absoluteness of everything is necessarily negated by the impossibility of an infinite regression. While this is a general objection to cosmological and first cause arguments, let's come back to the actual argument from motion by Aquinas. 1. Our senses prove that some things are in motion. I won't dispute this. 2. Things move when potential motion becomes actual motion. I will, however, dispute this. From a current understanding of physics, everything is in motion. There's no privileged point of view, so what seems not to be in motion just means that it's moving synchronously with the chosen frame of reference. This is about macromotion, as there is one other type of motion, the motion of molecules in a fluid and of material particles inside an atom, not counting the motion of massless particles such as photons or neutrinos. The concept of rest seems unattainable, so what does potential motion actually mean? Thomas Aquinas saw things from a perspective of a geocentric worldview, where Earth is an absolute frame of reference and the only objects he perceived were sized to a senses, rather than the dynamic world with no absolute frame of reference and ever-moving subatomic particles. But let's see if we can update this premise. The closest thing I can come to actual motion and potential motion is kinetic energy and potential energy. Things move when potential energy becomes kinetic energy. Let's see if this works. 3. Only an actual motion can convert a potential motion into an actual motion. Only kinetic energy can convert potential energy into kinetic energy. Well, energy transfer occurs, but it is far from the only way to convert potential energy into kinetic energy. The energy model does not describe Aquinas' arguments. Let's see if we can think of something else, something that Aquinas could have observed, and let's see if we can describe it in modern terms. 
If I hold a tennis ball with my hand and I open my hand, the ball falls. The potential motion of the ball became an actual motion. But which motion converted the potential motion of the ball into an actual motion? Was it my fingers moving away from the ball? Or was gravity a geometrical feature of space-time caused by the existence of the massive Earth? Even from Aquinas' perspective, falling objects could be seen as an exception of this premise. 4. Nothing can be at once in both actually and potentially in the same respect. For example, if both actual and potential, it is actual in one respect and potential in another. Well, energy is still the wrong analogy here, as a body can have both kinetic and potential energy at one given time. I cannot see this statement to have any meaning in any modern understanding of physics. By modern, I mean from Galileo and on. 5. Therefore nothing can move itself. Given that the premises are weak, then this conclusion is fallacious. I can probably fix this at this point. The only way to change the total momentum of a body is by applying an external force. 6. Therefore, each thing in motion is moved by something else. Except for a force not necessarily being the momentum of something else. Well, I probably missed the proper physical analogy for Aquinas motion, for heat meant something that is not one single property in modern physics. So let's wave that we can fix the argument. 8. Everything in actual motion is moved by something else in actual motion whatever actual motion means. 7. The second of motion cannot extend at infinitum. And let's wave that philosophers are right, and it is indeed impossible to have an infinite regression, or for Achilles to catch the turtle. So, b. Sequence of motion cannot extend at infinitum. So, the only way b to be logically true is for a to have a necessary exception. 8. Therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, put in motion by no other, and this everyone understands to be God. And this necessary exception is the first mover, put in motion by no other. Given that A has an exception, it should be corrected. A. Everything in actual motion, but a necessary exception, is moved by something else in actual motion. Now we have the conclusion. C. There is a first mover, and a desired conclusion. D. The first mover is God. Claiming that the first mover is my preconceived God is a special pleading. We make a philosophical argument to justify the exception I want to make. But some wordings of Aquinas' fifth way say something like And this fifth mover is what we call God. The impossibility of the infinite regression necessitates an exception, and from the exception we just name that exception. But it means nothing. It means there's one thing called God, but it does not mean that this God is the personal supernatural being that listens to prayers. By my main objection, assuming infinite regression is indeed impossible, is why there is one exception. And that is where I come back to the very nature of the first way. This is a very dynamic universe where everything is in motion. Actual motion is the norm and rest is an illusion. So one first mover doesn't make much sense. Everything is a first mover colliding with other movers to affect each other motion. So the premise A just reads. A. Everything in actual motion except for every physical entity is moved by something else in actual motion. So, no need to label the only exception with such loud terms as God.